Hello, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Alejandra Acosta. I'm a policy analyst in our higher education team at New America. Uh, welcome to our event on Pell Student Eligibility for the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, hosted by New America's Open Technology Institute and Higher Education Program. Today, we're excited to talk about the Emergency Broadband Benefit, a subsidy program implemented by the federal government during the COVID-19 pandemic to address challenges in accessing broadband. Through this program, people can receive up to a $50 credit to use toward internet services and up to a $75 credit for those who live on tribal lands. And college students who receive the Pell Grant can get this benefit too. During the pandemic, millions of Americans struggled to get online during a time when most of life was com completely virtual and college students were no exception. I want to open this event by personifying the issue and telling you about who today's college students really are. College students today are more diverse than ever, and most don't fit into our historical image of the 18-year-old student who just moved out of their parents' home, lives in a four-year college campus dorm, and eats at the campus dining hall. In reality, most of today's college students are more diverse, they are older, and they have many responsibilities outside of school. Very few students fit that traditional image that still lives in many of our minds. These days, only 13% of college students live on a college campus, and 37% of all college students are over 25 years old. That fresh out of high school college student that can focus on school and clubs is increasingly in the minority. Instead, nearly half of today's college students are financially independent. This means that they financially support themselves and do not depend on their parents for money. Over two thirds of college students work while in college so that they can financially support themselves and 40% go to school part time so that they can work and take care of their various responsibilities outside of college classes. Despite working while in school, 31% of students live at or below the federal poverty level. Today's students have responsibilities beyond themselves too. Nearly a quarter of all college students and are raising children while taking classes. For them, it's not just about deciding what to major in or what classes to take next semester, but about managing children's needs and schedules on top of their own school and life responsibilities. Today's college students are also more racially diverse than ever. Black student enrollment has increased 72% between 2000 and 2010, and Latinx student enrollment increased 240% since 1996. Nearly half of today's college students are students of color. Unfortunately, students of color are more likely to be low income and attend part-time. Many are first-generation student college, college students as well. And uh, being a student of color comes with many challenges due to the systemic racism in our country. College students today have a lot on their plate and have always faced many challenges, but the pandemic brought these issues, including broadband access issues to light. When colleges made the rapid pivot online, many students who did not have broadband access at home lost the resources they used on their college campuses to get online, like computer labs and campus Wi-Fi. Students and their colleges did what they could to make it work. And many colleges provided students with hotspots. Some students even drove to their campus parking lots to access the campus Wi-Fi from their cars. Even students who already had Wi-Fi or were given those hotspots struggled though. Their connection proved to be too weak to support multiple people like roommates, siblings, or school-aged children who were all trying to get online for school and work at the same time. Many students struggled to watch a live lecture and would get bumped out of the session because of their weak broadband. Others would hear every other word and still others had to sacrifice their own class and study time so that someone else in their home could have access to the internet and therefore their classes or work. What's worse is that these challenges were not felt equally across college students. Students of color, low income students and rural students struggled to get online much more than their white wealthier and urban counterparts. A May 2020 survey by Digital Promise, a congressionally authorized nonprofit organization, 
found that students of color and low income students had internet connectivity issues more than white students and students from households earning over $100,000. 23% and 17% of Black and Latinx students respectively struggled with connectivity, while only 12% of white students did. And in New America's recent nationally representative survey varying degrees, 57% of all respondents said that college would be a challenge if they did not have stable high-speed internet. That's already a lot, but for Latinx college students and caregiving students, this number was higher. Nearly two thirds of Latinx college student respondents and caregiving student respondents in our survey said college would be a challenge if they did not have stable high speed internet. The digital divide does not affect all college students equally. Even students who live in areas with strong broadband can struggle with connectivity because they can't afford it. That's where a program like the emergency broadband benefit can help. I'll leave it up to our keynote speaker and panelists to talk more about the program and how it can help college students. But I do wanna make one thing clear as I end these opening remarks. The digital divide is real for college students. Whether students are taking all of their classes in person, are enrolled in an online program, or are engaged in a mix of the two, stable high-speed internet is absolutely essential for them to do the daily work to ultimately earn their degree and change their life. And it's even more important to make quality broadband accessible to close racial inequities that exist in the digital divide and in our higher education system. Today's college students, the commuters, the parents, returning adults, low income students and students of color need to hear about the emergency broadband benefit program so that they can access affordable quality internet to pursue their college dreams. With that, I will pass it over to our keynote speaker, Jessica Rosenworcel, Acting Chairwoman of the Federal C Communications Commission. Thank you. And hello, everyone. It is great to be with the Open Technology Institute and New America's Higher Education Program. As uh, Alejandro was just mentioning last week, the team at New America released this really big survey about what the pandemic has meant for education and specifically, learning at home. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend you take a look because if you dig into the research, you'll see the kind of numbers that explain precisely why we're gathered right here, right now. And what the team found about who is connected and who is underconnected during the pandemic is striking. They determined that cost is really one of the biggest reasons why families lack internet service where they live. In fact, the data show that 18% of families who have home broadband say their service has been cut off at least once in the past 12 months because they had problems paying for it. And among those families that might rely on a mobile subscription to get online with a smartphone, one in six had their service cut off at some point during the past year. What that tells us is that a significant number of Americans who need to be online are making month to month decisions about whether or not they can afford to pay for internet access. And faced with the burden of having to decide whether to pay for essentials like housing, transportation, or medicine, they can let their internet service lapse. So we can all agree that with all the things we have to worry about during this pandemic, nobody should have to choose between putting food on the table or paying their broadband bill. But the data show very clearly it's happening. But change is happening too, because help has arrived for millions of American families. And that's because at the close of last year, Congress approved a COVID relief package that included $3.2 billion to establish the emergency broadband benefit. This is a big deal. It's our nation's largest ever program to help Americans afford internet service. And that includes college students and Pell Grant recipients too. So with this program in place, eligible households can now receive discounts of up to $50 a month for broadband service or up to $75 a month if they reside on tribal lands. And participants can also receive a one-time $100 discount off of a computer or tablet. So Congress gave us only 60 days to write rules for this program and so the FCC staff burned the midnight oil, staying up late nights and weekends to stand this program up in record time. 
we decided we would put consumers first and we established guiding principles for the emergency broadband benefit. We determined that it needed to be expansive, inclusive, and transparent. And because this program is funded with appropriated funds, we sought to use the resources we have fairly, smartly, and efficiently. And we hit all the deadlines. And on May 12th, the commission opened the emergency broadband benefit to the public. And since that time, households across the country that are eligible including those who struggled with job loss during the last year, who have a child in the free and reduced school lunch program, or who received a Pell Grant, have benefited from the broadband supported by this program. We've also learned a lot during the six weeks that the program's been up and running. And even though it's only been open for a short time, I wanna to talk today about the lessons learned that we can apply to our ongoing efforts and any future initiatives to help Americans afford broadband. To me, the first and top line takeaway from the past few weeks is that there is consumer demand and consumer need for a broadband affordability program. In the first week after launching the emergency broadband benefit, more than 1 million households signed up. For months, you know, we pointed to surveys to show that too many Americans were worried about how to pay their broadband bill, but more than 1 million enrollees in one week proves beyond any doubt that too many households are struggling to afford to get online. As of this week, that number exceeds 3 million and it continues to grow. While the emergency broadband benefit was established to help families get through the pandemic, with these enrollment numbers at this stage in the crisis, I think it's clear that the need for the emergency broadband benefit or something similar will outlast COVID-19. Now, the second key lesson I would draw from the program rollout so far is that trusted voices are the lifeblood of successful outreach and enrollment campaigns. We are working with organizations and officials at the national, state, and local level. I've personally participated in outreach events with multiple members of Congress, tribal leaders, and a diverse group of local and national advocates. We've done national press appearances and local news stories. We've joined HBCUs to discuss the importance of this program. We've held over 30 Spanish language presentations, briefings, and interviews. And we even got the NFL on board with a player on the Arizona Cardinals joining me for an editorial and the Miami Dolphins Foundation developing a video to promote this program. And stay tuned because there's more to come. The FCC staff has done over 200 virtual public presentations on this program since April. And those have ranged from small local events for community groups and libraries to larger train the trainer style events with national nonprofit organizations. And we partnered across government too. We worked with the Department of Labor to provide information to state unemployment offices and workforce associations across the country. We hosted webinars with the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the Department of Education sent emails to every single Pell Grant recipient to tell them about this opportunity. And as you know, that's more than 6 million students nationwide. Since February, we have enlisted over 24,000 partners, ranging from local boys and girls clubs, school districts, libraries, YMCA's food banks, Meals on Wheels and grassroots organizers to national nonprofits and key individuals who focus on digital inclusion to help us spread the word. And we've empowered those partners with a customizable toolkit that includes a wide variety of materials to use when spreading the word about this important program. And just so you know, those materials are available in English and Spanish, along with 13 other languages. So you add it all up. And by leveraging the power of trusted voices and earned media opportunities, we've raised enough awareness about this program to enroll millions of Americans. And looking at the data, we've noticed a real increase in traffic to our website and enrollments when there are news broadcasts and local reports about the program. But of course, we're not done yet. And the third lesson to take away from the past few months is the importance of being nimble. The emergency broadband benefits not like a wind up doll that we can just merrily send on its way. It needs monitoring and it needs regular care. Before the start of this program, the FCC hosted a series of roundtable events to hear from our partners, my staff has continued to hold these conversations after the program got underway. And today I'm announcing we're gonna start a new round of listening sessions with stakeholders to learn best practices. I wanna know what's worked, what didn't, 
and what ideas our partners have for next steps on outreach. You've got a good idea, bring it. Our virtual door is open. Now, part of being nimble also involves looking at the data and seeing what we can learn. And in the spirit of greater transparency around the program, I'm pleased to announce that today we're gonna to make more granular enrollment data public down to the local level. And for the information gurus out there, that means figures at the three digit zip code level. This is a lot more granular than the statewide data we've used to date. And we're hoping it can be used to help improve our understanding of where the program is reaching consumers. I hope everyone can take a look at this new data, slice and dice it different ways to identify what changes the program would benefit from under existing law and in any subsequent legislative effort that follows. Now, the last lesson I'd like to close with is this. Even though the emergency broadband benefit is a national program, it is important to remember that this program is successful household by household. It's not state by state or county by county. And that is why it is so important to develop local pathways to reach those who need this program the most. So let me talk about one of those households we were able to reach. Amanda Schirmhorn is a mom. In fact, she's a mother to four kids. She lives in rural Minnesota, where thanks to a Pell Grant, she is getting a degree. But it hasn't been easy. She has struggled without a reliable internet connection and her kids have struggled too, especially her son with autism. To do her classwork, Amanda would sometimes sit in her car in the parking lot of Minnesota State Community and Technical College just to use the free Wi-Fi signal. After time, she would rise at 4 a.m. just to get her online homework done before her children would wake for the day and exhaust their limited home connection with their virtual school. Amanda, however, was determined not to let her lack of reliable and consistent internet access stop her from getting her education. And whoa, that grit really matters. Because as New America has found, nearly one in five community college students reported stopping their education during this pandemic because they lacked sufficient internet access. So Amanda has both incredible drive and very long days. But now with the broadband benefit we have, we can make it a bit easier for her and for her children. And that's just one household. One household we can help with broadband. One household that can now keep up with school and so much more in modern life that has moved online. One household we can prevent from being consigned to the wrong side of the digital divide. Now imagine doing that again and again and again, household after household after household. That's what the emergency broadband benefit looks like. And while we think nationally about this program, its benefits may be best counted one by one, household by household, because the stories they tell are powerful. This program is powerful. Demand for it is out there. Local efforts to get the word out about its benefits are key, and that's especially true for Pell Grant recipients. Being nimble and data-driven is essential because we really have to meet consumers where they are. And it's also important to recognize that our success comes down to reaching individual households so that everyone, no matter who they are or where they live, has a fair shot at opportunity in the digital age. Thank you. My name is Emily Balquest, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director at Higher Learning Advocates, a nonprofit advocacy organization working toward bipartisan federal policies to better serve today's students. Thank you to New America's Higher Ed Program and OTI for having me and our panelists here today. I'm now happy to introduce you to our awesome panelists. Savannah Steiger is a senior at the University of Maine at Machias studying psychology and community studies. Savannah is also a parent to a six-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy and is an Aspen Ascend student parent advisor. Monty Russell is the president of Dene College a public tribal land-grant college in Salie, Arizona that serves the Navajo Nation. Carmen Lids is the Vice Chancellor and Chief Information Officer for the Los Angeles Community College District. And Edward Bartholomew is the Associate Bureau Chief of Consumer and Governmental Affairs at the Federal Communications Commission. 
If you have any questions for the panelists throughout our discussion, please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your Zoom screen or type your questions in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible today. I wanna to start with Savannah. Uh, so Savannah, you've had firsthand experience with connectivity challenges in order to complete your college coursework. Can you share with us a little bit about uh, the struggles that you overcame in order to keep learning? And did any of your classmates experience similar challenges with broadband access? Sure, yeah, um, I live in rural Maine and where I was living before where I live now, I lived off the grid and I had no internet and no power and all of that. And so to get my schoolwork done, I was driving to the campus and using the internet there with the kids in the car, or I would try to plan nap time and go to the library and sit in the parking lot there and do my schoolwork. And at one point they did give us hot spots, and those worked, um, oh my goodness, oh I'm sorry. So those worked pretty well, but um, for some people they didn't because they're very hit or miss. One of my classmates who lived on the grid in town, she lived like in a dead zone. And so she would have to put her hotspot in the window at the right angle, just so she could get service, but it really only worked at certain times of day. And she actually worked nights. And so she slept during the day. So finding that window to do her homework was very difficult. And I had another friend who was a classmate who they just had unlimited data on their phones to use to get to have internet at their home and that even the unlimited data at the end of the month that slows down. And so I, I know a lot of people who have struggled with internet access. And what does that mean when thinking about trying to complete your assignments to tune into video lectures and ultimately work toward completing your college degree or credential? Um, I feel like it means that you definitely hate online classes. <laughs> I mean, at least I do and everyone I talk to, we're all just like, oh, online but um it, it's hard because you have to plan things and even for classes that are in person or have i had one this past semester that was online but we had to show up in the virtual world to the lecture and that didn't feel fair that was really difficult to do and so it makes everything much harder you have to plan that much more and i have several classmates who in addition to being parents and students work full time and so then it's like finding those little windows. And a lot of the time, even though I go to a small school and the professors usually worked with me at times, there was no other choice. It's like, you have to take this class at four in the afternoon. I'm like, that is a terrible time, but okay. Yeah, thanks Savannah. I appreciate you sharing that with us. And um, Monty, we're hoping that you can tell us a little bit about the challenges that your students faced during the pandemic in accessing the internet and how the emergency broadband benefit could help to improve their educational outcomes. Well, thank you. Well, of course, and, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, you know, I think I, I'd like to start off by saying that we think the word access is a very, if you look at the dictionary, it has a very specific answer, very specific definition, but it is not. It is a very vague word. And so, for example, when we converted from uh, when the pandemic just hit and we started trying to survey our students, what were their capacity with broadband, um, Wi-Fi, phones, th different things like that. We asked the question, do you have access to the internet, access to Wi-Fi? And one of the surveys came back and the person said yes. And then we asked them to explain a little more, all right? That ex explanation helps kind of drive where we're gonna provide some resources. And the response I got was, I drive 15 miles on top of a mesa, and then I climb a little higher on a hill, and I can get access through my phone. Now, nobody on this call and nobody listening would define that as access. But for our students, it was access, and they were happy to get that. And so I think that's something that, you know, some of the challenges that we faced of earlier, Savannah talked about the parking lots. And you know, colleges, universities all over this country created these parking lot spots. I mean, it's wonderful. We had to do what we had to do, but it also is embarrassing. It's embarrassing that this is what college, none of us, except for Savannah, would have would imagine that type of uh, education when they went to college. And for us here, because we're very remote, we're in the Northeast part of the state of Arizona, 
in the middle of the Navajo Nation, we would have families, not the student, but families come to our parking lot in a pickup truck, pull out blankets, spread them out over the ground, and their kids would be accessing the internet for the K-12. Their, their mom or dad might be doing something with college. And you had a whole family sitting in a parking lot just to attend kindergarten, just to attend fifth grade, just to attend college. And again, access. So I think one of the things that's important it, when we look at this is how do we try to transition? You know, And I think that's something that we're really talking about because this support for tribal lands, for our students, my students, $75 would go a long ways because what did I just explain? It'll go a long way so they can pay for their access. And that money that they save now goes to gasoline for access. So they're still at the same level they were, right? But it helps them, it helps them continue. And I think that's what we're really trying to focus with our tribal students because a lot of them come, we come from the hardest hit area. You know, the Navajo Nation was probably the hardest hit area during COVID. And then within the Navajo Nation, our college sits in an agency uh, in the middle of the Navajo Nation and which was hardest hit within the Navajo Nation. So our students overcame a lot. And a lot of these stories of resilience and determination and courage come down, not just in terms of surviving, but what they had to do in order to continue their college education. So this, this support allows them to move forward. You know, but I do have a concern, how long? Because the one thing that we have to think about is that this is not a problem that ends tomorrow, or this is a problem that'll go on forever. So how do we make sure that this is just one step in a long um, uh, traveling towards where we want to be? And I think one of the things you know, that, that we're looking at, and what's interesting for us is how do we get the word out to students who don't have access about here's an opportunity to get access. And it's one of those conundrums because most of our students, a lot of our students, you know, some of the data that was shared earlier talked about how, you know, they students uh, lost connectivity during the month and whatnot. Well, here, a lot of our students have uh, the phones that are subsidized. So they go through two or three phone numbers in a semester sometimes, you know, just to continue that. And so how do we communicate this to them? That's a challenge. It's a good challenge in the sense of there's something there to help. And I, and I think that's something that kind of motivates all of us. But I also think it's important that, you know, the, the access, it's also changing the way we deliver education. So, you know, one of the things that we, we know that even with access to broadband, it's limited. The more people on it, 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 it congests everything. So it's changing the way we teach to try to ensure that we're not running up the data bills. We're changing, we're trying to work with students in a different manner. I know that personally. I taught a photography class uh, during this. And, you know, you can imagine how much bandwidth that took in terms of people sending and all of that. So we started just texting. I mean, you know, you try to find workarounds like that. But having this ability, you know, we had students, all sorts of stories over and over. And I think this is something that uh, allows us an opportunity to say, okay, if we can get that, if a student can get that, then we can focus on the other two. There are three major hindrances for our students. One is transportation, childcare, and access to broadband. So if we can get one that's kind of okay, we can focus on the other two. And I think that's what we're doing now with this program. We can actually try to provide more gas stipends for transportation for students, childcare, for students when they come into the, if they have to come to a parking lot and provide that. So it also helps the institution in being able to try to address some of the other needs that are there. So it really has a, 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 a bonus impact on a lot of different areas. Thanks, Auntie. I really appreciate uh, you sharing those details and um, certainly your work um, on behalf of your students and 
um, helping them address those challenges during the pandemic and, um, and now and beyond. Um, thank you. Um, and Edward, I'll turn a little bit to you and um, I think it's a perfect segue. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, enrollment in the EBB program so far? I know we heard the chairwoman speak about that a little bit. Um, is there any information on how many Pell Grant recipients are signing up and what can colleges and universities do to help their students navigate this program? Are there best practices you recommend or is there any way that they can reach out to you for help with the application process? Sure. Um... So I'll break that apart in chunks. So the, the 3 million, 3 million is the top line number. So that's what um, the new data today tells us that over 3 million households are now enrolled. Um, we're not to the point yet where we've broken out the data by the different eligibility categories. Um, some of that's difficult to do and maintain privacy just because of where we're at with the numbers, but those are things that we're looking to make more data available as the program continues to move forward. So the new data set today does show data that's broken down to the ZIP3 level, um, which is something that a lot of partners and a lot of people who have been helping us to spread the word have been asking for. Um, so that's there now. I dropped the link to that in the chat um, while the chairwoman, acting chairwoman was giving her remarks. So you can find that there. Um, and I encourage everybody to go look at that data set. Um, in terms of Pell Grant recipients and, and sort of reaching people and what are best practices, um, as the acting chairwoman did mention, this is a household to household effort. And it is an out, you know, we need to meet people where they are. We're an agency um, that prior to the pandemic was on the road a lot. And we did do a lot of in-person events in a lot of places. And that all kind of came to a screeching halt. So we knew with standing up a program like this, where you have $3.2 billion worth of funding to get out, to create awareness around, um, and to make sure that people can, who need it, can take advantage of it. We knew that was going to need, we would need the help of trusted voices, partners, community organizers, and specific to Pell Grant recipients, um, you know, university financial aid offices jumping in and helping to spread the word, folks on campus making sure that their campus communities know about this. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and I think Savannah and Monty have touched on just the, the diversity and backgrounds of students today. Um, and that di you know, different people are coming from different places and, and access means different things for different folks. But we did know there was one group that we could reach out to who had a list of all the Pell Grant recipients in the country. And that was our friends at the Department of Education. Um, so early on, we reached out to them and they were able to send an email to every Pell Grant recipient. And that went to every 2020 to 2021 school year recipient and every 2021 to 2022 school year Pell Grant award recipient. Um, and I wanna make sure people can find this email if they're one of those people. So it came from an email address that is no reply at studentaid.gov. The subject line was apply for the emergency broadband benefit program. And the header in the email was you are eligible for the emergency broadband benefit program. So do the search, look in your email boxes, find that email. Um, the other great thing about that email is for Pell Grant recipients, that serves as your proof. So when you complete the online application that you can find at getemergencybroadband.org, yes, there's some questions about who you are, your background, address, all those things. There's a box you check that says I'm a Pell Grant award recipient. You'll have the ability to upload a copy of that email directly into that application. And that's how you get approved. So find the email, go sign up if you haven't already. Um, and I, I refer people to our toolkit. We've put together a lot of great materials that folks can grab and easily make use of uh, and, and to, you know, just get the word out there about this. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. I hope I got all the things that you teed up for me there. <laughs> yeah, great. Absolutely. Thanks, Edward. I appreciate that. Um, and maybe we can share in the chat again, um, that email address, the subject line, et cetera, for folks who are on the lookout for that email. Great. Um, Carmen, let's uh, hear from you. Uh, maybe a little bit about how um, the Los Angeles Community College District has been working to remove barriers for broadband access. Um, I believe there was a survey to students to identify these barriers and what are you and others at your institution and others in the state of California doing to help students enroll in the EBB program? Thank you, Emily. Um, 
before we go into uh, talking about the things that we have done, I want to to share a little bit of our about our students. So um, Los Angeles Community College District is amongst the largest in the nation with about 230,000 full and part time students across our nine colleges. About half of our students report their income near or below the poverty line um, each year. Um, LACCD distributes um, around $250 million in financial aid awards, um, not including student loans. Um, the financial aid is critical to opening doors in higher education to those who could not afford college otherwise. Um, those are the very Pell recipients that um, Edward was mentioning. Um, we also are a leading educator in California for Latinx and African-American students, including DACA students. Um, our nine colleges combined educates twice um, as many African-American and Latinx students than the University of California system um, in its entirety. Um, and one really important point is that about a third of our students are parents, 33%, um, just like Savannah. Um, every support that we provide to one of our students provides help to their entire family. Um, as um, Emily mentioned in spring of 2020, early in the pandemic, we conducted a student survey to understand the impact of the pandemic on our students. Um, from the sudden reordering of their daily life to most tragic personal consequences, um, some of our students have lost family, friends, uh, dear ones during this pandemic, we have all been challenged, but some of our students have been challenged more than, more than, um, more, more. Uh, we, um, we had about 11% response rate to, to the survey. And, and here is what we found, uh, which is not probably surprising to anybody on this panel. 80% um, of our students had access to internet. That meant 20% of students did not have access to internet. 14% uh, indicated that only sometimes have access to, in the, uh, to internet. And with the qualifications that Monty provided earlier, similar scenarios happen for our students either. When they say they have access to internet, that could mean a variety of things. 76% of our students had access to a computer with 15% indicating that only sometimes have an access to a device because they share it, just like they share their internet with their family, with their siblings, with their roommates. Um, for some of our students that have children, um, children that go to school themselves, it meant sacrificing their own computer time so their children can have the best connectivity or access to the device for them to complete their studies. Additionally, we found significant increase in the stress level and a multitude of personal cha challenges. Um, many of our students have lost their job or have reduced hours. They had uh, dealt with food insecurity, um, loss of housing, um, and more um, significant in some ways, loss of health care uh, or um, uh, child care for, for their um, for their children. Um, so the magnitude of this pandemic had serious practical implication, um, but from a technology perspective, from a broadband uh, perspective, it was nothing new. The broadband digital divide was there before the pandemic. It just shone a light on, on, the, on the lack of access across the, across the nation. Um, from an LACCD perspective, we had to reinvent every aspect of our operations. We have purchased and distributed over 40,000 devices to our students. We also, um, just like other uh, colleges and universities, enabled parking lots with Wi-Fi and opened them to our students when the health guidelines allowed for that to happen. Early in the pandemic, the ISPs have provided 30 days, 60 days free access for our students. That very shortly ended. Um, we had the FCC Lifeline program, which hasn't been mentioned, but it, it's been, it was an, an amazing resource for our students. Um, the City of LA Digital Inclusion Program, 
um, and the Foundation for California Community College College Buy Program that has been so important for our students in getting low, uh, low cost internet um, access. And um, I would be um, remiss not to mention that we have a fantastic group of faculty that have done whatever it took to, to continue teaching dur during the pandemic and utilizing all of the tools that we put at their disposal. We rolled out 365 new online software to accommodate with the variety of, of programmatic needs. The faculty have embarked and utilized these new tools to, uh, to provide um, access for uh, uh, capability for our students to continue their learning. Um, broadband and connectivity, I see as the virtual railroad and path to access information. And we need to build these high-speed networks, just like we have roads, highways, and alongside all of our railroads. Um, we need to increase affordability and accessibility of broadband service to all underserved residential areas and provide free wireless service in parks, public spaces across our communities. The emergency broadband program continues that support for our students, but it needs to, to be uh, sustainable. Um, and the availability of high-speed internet access it is essential, not only for, for teaching and learning, but for economic competitiveness and a high quality of life in the 21st century. Thank you again for the opportunity. Great, thank you, Carmen. Um, so looking forward, um, you know, I would love if the panelists could share their thoughts on what might happen uh, if and when the EVD program funding runs out. Um, do any of you have plans for how to continue to address these needs um, at the student level, institution level, the district level. Um, maybe Edward, uh, would you like to, to kick us off here? Happy to, and, and I think it might make sense for me to talk a little bit about how the program will wind down um, as a starting point. So um, it's $3.2 billion. Those funds will either become exhausted or six months after the end of the pandemic is declared by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Whichever one of those two happens first is when the program will end. Um, provider, we included some really important consumer protections in the rules of the program to make sure that families don't end up with bill shock when the program does end. So providers have to notify households when there is a, the last time that they will get the full discount on their bill. So if they're getting the full $50 or the full 75, when will that occur? The last time when they may get a partial discount on the bill. So there is a scenario where they might have a month that's partially offset and they don't get the full discount. And households need to continue to, will need to opt in to continue service with the provider. And that's true even if they were with that provider before the emergency broadband benefit started, they still need to affirmatively opt in to continue receiving service. And Really, those are designed so that nobody has the discount run out and suddenly they're accruing an extra 50 or 60 or whatever amount per month for one, two months before they realize that they now have a debt that they owe to a broadband service provider. Um, I do want to just point out that uh, Lifeline was mentioned and, and there's a question in the chat that talked about, you know, USF programs. Um, Lifeline was created under the Reagan administration. It was very much primarily focused on telephone support. In recent years, there is a broadband component to it. It's $9.25 per month or $34.25 if you're on tribal land. And this program really builds on a lot of the tools and resources that were built for the Lifeline program. So you'll know that note that life, if you qualify for Lifeline, you're automatically qualified for the EBB. Um, I can't speculate on where a program like this goes next, but Lifeline is a current program um, that people can make use of. Um, it's slightly different, but it does exist today and will exist after the EBB ends. Okay, great. Thanks for that information. Um, would anyone perhaps uh, like to speculate what uh, they think should happen if the program runs out or um, how we're going to continue to support students in, in broadband access? I'll, I'll start. Um, I would... Um, 
I would approach this in um, removing um, barriers to uh, universal sustainable branded access by looking at it in a, a four-prong approach. One, um, having quality um, internet service available. And so the availability of the broadband um, across all areas. Um, two, um, access to devices, ensuring that all families um, have access to a computer. Um, a three, um, um, advocacy for policy change, ensuring that a program such as the EBB um, are not um, time bound, but are um, continuous programs um, to provide some subsidies for families that most need them. And um, number four, um, digital literacy, ensuring that all of the, the families and all of the students, um, every person knows what each program provides for them, what programs there are available for them out there, um, and deciphering uh, what will provide to them. Um, sometimes um, uh, deciphering the, the various types of available programs can be can be difficult for for some families so making it very simple and clear this is what the program provides and this is how it compares to this other program thank yeah. you yeah yeah that makes sense or perhaps if there were um, navigators to help kind of navigate these different programs and issues and and help kind of with that digital literacy thanks Carmen for for sharing that and um, Monty would would love to hear if you have any thoughts and um, you know, about Pell Grant students who are eligible for the EBB or maybe other students um, who don't receive a Pell Grant and how are we going to help them, you know, continue to uh, work toward completing their degree? Uh, I'm going to circle back to access. I think that we, we need to redefine that in a manner that it's not access to broadband, it's not access to the internet, but it's access to education. And if you look at it as access to education, it changes the way we look at the problem and then attempt a solution. While EBB is great right now, the reason for it is a Band-Aid. We have that need right now. Well, a Band-Aid is not physical therapy. A Band-Aid is not gonna solve what we need to do going forward. So we need to come, come back, as Carmen said, I think there are things that we can do in the immediate, but ultimately it's a big policy decision. And, you know, and I think that's, I think where we come from being on a, a reservation is that geography should not define if I can go to college from my home. That's just wrong. That's, you know, I'll say it, that's un-American, right? It should not be like that. So if we change the question, not about access to the internet, but access to college, then we also are looking at it in a different way. And so I think one of the things that, that we're doing, I mean, we, we got to focus on what we can do here so we can talk these big talks and, you know, all this and that. And then, you know, we, we leave this and maybe nothing happens. So we have to do something to address what we have right now. And so one of the things we're doing is we're creating micro campuses across the reservation. We've already uh, built two or at another one. So I talked about these long drives of our students. So if you're driving an hour to class or an hour back and you cut that to 30 minutes, that's a real game changer in terms of your day and what you can do with your family and things like that. And one hour is not the, is not the norm. It's more like two hours. So providing different access points. The other thing we're doing is we're working with K-12 schools enrollment has been declining over the last many years and it's gonna to continue to decline. So there's a lot of empty space at K-12 schools. How can we repurpose that to provide an access point for education, for parents and, 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 and families? So trying to change that idea is what we're looking at going forward. I think you know the, 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 the focus that we really have right now is if we can at least right now, get some breathing room through this program. We can kind of marshal our, our resources, our limited resources. Um, that's one thing, tribal colleges, you know, we don't have a lot of money, um, but we're scrappy. We know how to get things done and, and things like that. So if we can remarshal those resources, both financial as well as uh, just the personal resources, I think that'll help us get further along. 
And I think the other thing is really making the, the argument of the importance of education. You know, we keep getting a, a rap about higher ed doesn't do this, doesn't do that. And I think really being able to show that connection, this is where it's needed. This is how it can help your family. This is how you could improve. And that starts with access. And it's about education. It's about, you know, um, your family climbing the ladder. So I think it has to be done on a lot of different levels. And I think, you know, we're gonna engage where we can fit, but we're also gonna to have to do things that are specific just to our students and our population and our community. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Savannah, can you tell us just from the student angle, uh, especially as a student parent, what do students need to continue to be successful and in thinking you know, that perhaps the EBB program um, might be, is winding down, um, uh, how do we continue to connect with students and uh, get the word out about other resources they may have? And um, we just love to hear your, your student perspective about um, what we can do and what students need to be successful. Yeah, um, I think that Moni really hit the head on the nail on the head with changing what access means. Right, because like just because I can access the internet on my phone doesn't mean it's really the class is accessible. And so I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, I would love to see a sliding scale for internet payments come into play because basically you have to have internet now if you want to function in the 21st century. I feel like you pretty much have to have it if you want to go to school or if you want to work a job that is like an upper level job. You've got to have internet. You can't not have it and so I think that that needs to change and I would love to see students being given more money like that always helps things and just to continue asking students what do you need what do you need how can we help because they have the most true and best opinion of it because what I need is different than what my classmates need is different what students at other colleges need like we all have diverse needs and so by asking everybody how can we help you and then hearing and then using that information I think is essential. Yeah great. Um, I think maybe one more quick question before um, we wrap up this afternoon um, and maybe Monty and Carmen could kick us off um, with helping to answer this but um, what are some resources that colleges and universities need um, to help their students apply for the EBB and to navigate the program. Carmen, we were talking about this a little bit before and, um, and Monty about reaching students and how do we get the word out? How do we help them enroll and access this, this benefit that's been created and what do colleges need to be able to do that? I'll go first and, and uh, I'll be brief. Because uh, based on the earlier conversations we had, uh, Carmen had a lot of ideas here, and, and I want to make sure she's able to get to them. But I think that it comes down to a real simple thing. We have to try to find a way to get to the students where they're at, whatever that means. You know, and that's not a cop out answer, but it's really trying to say for us here, it's really different. I created this a social media uh, group with students that's really trying to and and this is one of the things they're focusing on because they're much more likely to to hear from and listen to you know uh, one of their friends than from me and saying look at what I got uh, with this program so I think that's really important it's just trying to find whatever avenue there is for us it, you know and and it's a lot of different things too it's not just you know we talked about it, it, with the uh, FCC uh, acting chair earlier, talked about all these events. And so all of those and whatever's left out. I mean, I, I hate to say, you know, it that generally, but for us, it's really trying to get to how we can get to them. I think one of the things too is trying to use employers to help because those employers, their kids may be going to school and that's one way to try to address it. So looking at the business community to try to have that, you know, where can we insert this information um, and it might be helpful there, so. I agree with that wholeheartedly. The, the more communication um, is out there, the more likely it is that uh, a, a student will see it somewhere. Um, the other thing that I would say is students tend to, to uh, look at their peers as trusted source. So um, um, using 
um, other students as champions using the, the student um, government associations on um, the colleges as a, as a funnel of that information and the communication distribution mechanism, it's, uh, it's critical. Um, Edward mentioned the uh, Department of Education um, lists of uh, Pell recipients and, and how each one of them has been sent an email. The, the challenge with that is that although that, that's a, a mass way of reaching everyone, um, a uh, subset of those students are gonna look at those emails and are gonna say, this is not legitimate. This is a, this is a scam. Tr someone's trying to, to convince me to, to uh, I don't know, um, be taken advantage of. And we've been you know, having the security awareness um, uh, for for our students, uh, trying to to keep them away from bad guys. So sometimes it's really difficult to to make the dif differentiation between the bad guys and the good guys, particularly when you get an email saying, "I'm going to give you money." Um, we've we've been specifically making them aware that that those are not typically a good thing. So um, so we we've had that challenge not not only with the with the EBB, but also when we were um, handing out um, uh, uh, student assistance from, from the, the her funds or, or whatnot, uh, direct aid to, to students, it's sometimes a challenge. So multiple communications coming from different sources that can then reinforce that that's a legitimate offering and um, get it out through, through the means that they communicate through. I don't care whatever social media we, we manage to do, as well as um, if it is permissible at, at your institution to text the students with, with information, then that is another, um, another mechanism to do it, post it on the website, student portals, um, as well as other areas where they might go, like library sites um, and, and whatnot. Um, the other thing is there are other um, locations where, where students are that are in need go, um, such as uh, food pantries, um, uh, food uh, uh, ho housing, um, community centers, etc. So I would make sure that this information is also available on the um, uh, city sites or, or the local community um, sites that provide access. Um, to other uh, to other resources, so then the students would find this in the same place they would go for other necessities. Um, I truly see internet um, access being um, as much a necessity as electricity. Um, and I'm going to end there since we are at ten o'clock mark. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, I think this was um, so helpful and informative and. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, if you're looking for more information related to the EBB program, you can visit getemergencybroadband.org to learn more and, and check out some of the resources that we listed over in the chat uh, throughout the session. Um, hope everyone has a great afternoon. <laughs>